Hey guys, hello, welcome back to my channel. It's me, Steven. I'm in Orlando for a nice long layover, 32 hours, longest layover I've ever had. And my plan was to go into SeaWorld, but the weather, it's pretty steadily raining. It's very not nice out there. Um, it's the worst hasn't even um, hit. Apparently it's supposed to get worse later. Um, but there is going to be a break in it, so if it's a nice enough day later on, I might go down to SeaWorld. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me, I have an annual pass, so if I can, I should go. Uh, but I figured since I have the time, I would make a video. Hi. Um, and one of those things I have not done yet is a terminology video. Flood attendants on YouTube toss a lot of phrases around pretty liberally. Uh, with maybe some definition, but not a lot of context sometimes. So I figured I would put together a list of words, phrases, terms that we use frequently. Um, and um, let's get started because the other way I talk, I'll just take for 45 minutes talking about anything. Um, so first one, flight crew. Flight crew would be a captain or a pilot. Cabin crew would be flight attendants. Um, and in talking about flight crew, there's something I should mention that I did not write down, which would be an FFDO, a Federal Flight Deck Officer. Why did I just blank out? A Federal Flight Deck Officer, FFDO. That means that they're actually armed up in the cabin there, uh, up in the, the uh, cockpit. <clears throat> um, so in the event of some something horrific, we've got a, a, a captain. Typically it's a captain. I wonder if a first officer can be an FFDO. I think so, I think so. Um, but uh, FFDO would be a flight deck officer, which would mean a captain or a first officer uh, who is armed. Um, and there's a whole security system about that. Google it, it's pretty interesting. Um, cabin crew would be flight attendants. Uh, check-in or showtime. They can be used interchangeably. We typically use check-in. It could be showtime. Um, but that would be when we have to report for duty. In my airline, we actually have to check in in our crew room. Some other airlines can check in on their own, on their device or on their phone. We actually have to go to our crew room. One reason is because we actually have to sit down with our crew and determine who flies what position and that is based on seniority. Who's ever most senior can choose the position they want to fly. Lots of times the most senior people want to go all the way in the back, flying position C. Fine with me because I like to fly lead or B. But uh, that would be show time or check-in. Duty period is the time between checking in and 30 minutes past the time you block in from the flight. So um, if I checked in as I did last night for a flight that uh, my check-in or my show time was at 1040 or 2240 if you're learning military time. Um, my check-in was 2240. My duty period would have ended 30 minutes after we arrived in um, Orlando this morning. So. The time that that really counts when you really want to pay attention to your duty time is when you are approaching 14 hours of duty. And that duty time is going to encapsulate your check-in. It's going to enca encapsulate um, any sits between flights. It's going to be um, boarding, deplaning, all of that time, not just your block hours or not just your credit hours. Uh, and uh, it ends 30 minutes after you block in. Uh, and, uh, you know, on my airline, we can be scheduled up to 14 hours of duty. That can be extended up to 16 hours because of weather delays, air traffic control, or some other odds and ends. Crew scheduling always seems to find a reason to make it one of those things. Um, otherwise, we would be timing out and could not fly. We are allowed, <clears throat> I don't know why, uh, we can, if we, um, if we volunteer, to we can work past 16 hours. 
um, of duty time, they have to get our approval. I would never agree to work um, past a 16 hour duty day because I know for a fact I would be fatigued and you wouldn't want me to have to operate any emergency equipment if I had been working over 16 hours. So I would personally never agree to um, an extension past my 16. But um, so that's why you would really, for the most part, want to pay attention to your duty period that I can think of. Uh, deadhead would be repositioning a flight attendant from one airport to another to continue their trip. Um, frequently enough in Vegas, I'm deadheaded from Vegas to Oakland <clears throat> or to Seattle, where I would then continue my trip working the flight. When you're deadhead, you are sitting in a, a passenger seat. It's also called a positive space seat because, uh, or um, a revenue seat, because typically it's a seat that passengers would pay to fly us on. Uh, but when we're deadheading, we sit in one of those seats. We have to be in uniform in my airline. I think just in case we have to board a plane for a flight attendant who's running late maybe, or if we actually have to take the place of an injured flight attendant or a flight attendant that didn't show up for work or whatever. So uh, deadheading is can be nice because it can be relaxing. You're just sitting in a plane. We're allowed to watch you know, a movie on a tablet or a laptop, we're allowed to wear headphones, we can sleep if we want to, we're supposed to take our identifying stuff off, like our badge or our our wings, <clears throat> but deadheading can be fun. I find it exhausting, I hate deadheading. Uh, I'd rather work a flight than deadhead. Because um, when I'm deadheading, sometimes I'm stuck in like a window seat or a middle seat, and I can't just get up when I want to. <laughs> Uh, um, so that's deadheading. A ferry flight would be when an airline has to reposition an airplane. It's to, it's empty. There's no guests on board. There's no paying guests. Um, it's just a flight crew and a cabin crew. And I don't even think you need a full cabin crew. I think you could have it like one flight attendant. Um, but that would be... <clears throat> a ferry flight would be, for example, when um, the airline... You know, there's a, a, a aircraft that is not working. It's irop or irop inoperable uh, at an airport, and there's an extra plane, for example, in Fort Lauderdale. They're not using. They might just fly that plane to another airport to have it continue on with paying guests on board. Uh, or, for example, there's a bunch of storms approaching Fort Lauderdale where we have a lot of aircraft. They might want to get those aircraft out of there and somewhere safer like Dallas or Detroit. And so they might ferry flight those planes and just get them out of the way. I don't know if they would actually ferry flight in that case. Repositioning might be a different thing entirely. But ferry flights um, do not have any paying guests on board. But we do need a flight crew, obviously, to fly the plane. And I think at least one cabin crew member. Yeah, I think they have to have at least one. I don't think you have to have a full crew. If I'm wrong and somebody knows, drop a comment below. Um, a leg, you all know what a leg is, I think, but it is a segment of a trip. Uh, it's um, from one airport to another. So a leg would be from, like last night, Las Vegas to Orlando, one leg. If I had to stop in Dallas first and then um, Jacksonville and then Orlando that would be three legs or three segments um, IROP IROP irregular operations I wrote down abnormal operations due to mechanical issues weather air traffic control delays anything beyond the control of the airline so IROP would be, say, for example, a hurricane is heading Fort Lauderdale. And a lot of our, um, our main hub is in Fort Lauderdale. So it might ca cause the airline to scramble a bit to make sure that all of our flight attendants are safe in different locations, that we have enough ways to maybe get aircraft to a safer airport or a safer destination. Uh, so IROP or IROP could be a whole system-wide problem 
but it, it can also be something as simple as a coffee pot. So for example, if our hot water beverage maker or the coffee pot isn't working, there might be a little orange sticker on there saying EROP or IROP. Uh, if a lavatory or a seat isn't functioning, there might be a sign or a sticker on there saying it is EROP or uh, not operational. Um, open time and trade board. Open time would be if I had a trip next week that I just did not want to go on or I had obligations with my family or friends where that trip would have been really inconvenient and did not want to go on it and I'm willing to drop it and be free of it. Mind you, I wouldn't be paid for those hours. I'm dropping that trip into open time, meaning that anybody can try to take that trip out of open time. Our open time is based on seniority, so whoever has more seniority would have first dibs on that. Uh, if in open time, if you pick up a trip in open time in my airline, and it puts you over 85 hours, which is uh, our threshold for time and a half, you get time and a half for anything uh, over 85. Now that's different with our trade board. The trade board is pretty hot right now because we are so short on reserves, we can't drop trips. So we put them in a trade board, which is there still are trips, but if someone sees it and wants it, they can take it from us, but someone has to work that trip. So it's sort of a trade board, like you can, I'll trade it. And sometimes they'll trade it for other trips. I don't like this trip. I like what your trip looks like. Let's swap. So you can do that too. That's why we call it the trade board. Uh, but unfortunately, if you pick up a trip out of trade board, again, this is my airline, um, and it puts you over 85 hours, it does not um, get you time and a half. It's just straight hourly, which is fine with me because I'll take anything, right? Um, so if I do get a trip, if you ever hear me say I picked up a trip, for the most part, it's something out of trade board because I'm junior enough that I typically don't get a lot of great trips out of uh, open time. Positive contact, pretty important phrase. <clears throat> I wrote down actual person-to-person -person contact for the purpose of notification of a trip assignment or of other info. So crew scheduling, when I am assigned a trip on reserve, crew scheduling has to call me, I have to answer, and there has to be person-to-person -person communication letting me know that I have been assigned a trip on my reserve. If they called, for example, and left a voicemail, and I didn't answer the phone, well, there's a whole bunch of problems there because you have to answer the phone. <laughs> but if you, for example, didn't answer the phone and they left a voicemail saying, hi, you have a trip that starts in two hours, be at the airport, you're going to Detroit, that's not positive contact because that was not person to person connecting. That has to happen. If I'm be, being rerouted or rescheduled, any of those things, crew scheduling has to talk to me in person, positive contact in order for any of this to really work. If they don't leave, talk to me in person, doesn't happen. Uh, so positive contact is vital. There's very few times that you could tell someone um, secondhand information. If we're being delayed, crew scheduling calls the lead. If the lead has contact information for the rest of the crew, then the lead could potentially contact the rest of the crew regarding a delay. But in terms of a reschedule and all that stuff, I think it's all has to be positive contact. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> a reserve line. I think you probably know what a reserve line, if you've watched any of these YouTube videos. A reserve line is when you are on reserve, basically you're on call, and um, you have a, you've bid for a schedule. Hmm. This goes hand in hand with notification period. So on reserve in my company, you basically bid for a reserve line where you are on reserve certain days and off other days. That's really the only control you have over bidding when you're on reserve. You can bid for a line, which is a schedule, where your days off are on particular days. During those days where you're on reserve, 
you will have a notification period. Now with my airline, there are some airlines where you have like a 24 hour, they can cruise scheduling can call you anytime they want. Oh, that sounds terrifying. But with my airline, they have regularly 10 hours of a day that they can call you and say, hey, Stephen, we have a trip for you. So our notification periods are A, B, and C. A is midnight to 10 a.m. B is 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. I always chose B because I wanted to sleep until 7 a.m. I don't want to wake up at midnight wondering, mm, do I have a trip? Uh, and C, which is 2 p.m. to midnight. So notification period, mine started at 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. They could call me at any point during those two, those two times and assign me a trip. That trip, this is for those people who are in reserve now who don't understand this because it happens all the time. If they assign you a trip, it does not have to be within those hours. The trip can start three, four, five hours after. Um, but you are notified during that period of time. Very important to understand. Uh, lots of people complain, oh, can they, they assign me a trip that started like at 10 o'clock and I'm off at reserve at, at five. Mm, no, they assigned you a trip. It just starts after your notification period. Um, there was something else about notification period I wanted to say. I've forgotten. All right, so next, reserve out of base. Reserve out of base is kind of weird. When we have a surplus of uh, reserves, which is not the case right now, um, but uh, there are too few reserves in Atlantic City. It's a small base, there's not a lot of flight attendants there, and they need flight attendants to be on reserve, just in case, right? They might assign 5, 10, 15 flight attendants from Las Vegas who has a surplus, we don't right now, but when we have a surplus, they might set, fly those, probably deadhead them, to Atlantic City where they would be in a nice hotel room and it's a nice location apparently in that uh, in that area um, and that those flight attendants would be on reserve. They would have a reserve notification period just like they would at home, uh, but they're on reserve out of base. So the trip that they would be assigned, if they were assigned a trip, would start and end at that base. Um, the silver lining to this is that even if you're not used at all, you still accrue uh, per diem, uh, I, which if I have not mentioned, I will. So you'll accrue per diem during that whole time, even if you're not used which is nice, okay. So I might as well add per diem into my list now that I'm talking about it. So per diem is the hourly amount of money that we receive for the entire trip. So if we leave at 10 p.m. one night and four days later we get back to our base at 10 p.m., we're gonna earn $2 and I think it's 2.31. I think it's $2.31. Every single hour we're gone. And that doesn't sound like a lot of money until you look at the whole month. And that could be five, six, seven hundred dollars a month. Last year, I think I earned over five thousand dollars in per diem. And per diem on anything other than a turn is non-taxable. Yay! Uh, so that's per diem. Um, let's see. KCM. The best thing ever created, KCM, known crew member. That is, uh, so flight attendants, in most airports, there are some that don't have KCM. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, we actually, at my airline, did not have KCM uh, until, from what I heard, the whole time. So we had to actually earn it or apply for it or something. But KCM allows me to go to the airport slip past all of regular security through a separate TSA line um, just for crew. Now, we don't have to be in uniform. We can be flying uh, leisure uh, traveling without our uniform, and we can still go through KCM unless it's uh, international. And I don't know if that's just my airline or not, but if we're flying internationally uh, uh, as uh, leisure travel, we can't go through KCM, we have to go through regular security. But um, if you do go through KCM, 
in uniform. You can take anything you want. We're allowed to bring, I could bring a two liter gallon, a two liter bottle of soda if I want to. If I were randomly selected, which is gonna be another phrase, for a security search, because we do get random checks, um, I can, I will be a little bit more scrutinized before being allowed to pass through but I can still take anything I want in terms of liquids and things like that. If I'm not in uniform, I actually have to abide by all the regular TSA rules with liquids and gels, 331, whatever it is. Um, so if I'm not in uniform and I'm going through KCM and I get a random security check, I actually, and if I have a giant coffee or a big bottle of water, I have to chuck it. I have to throw it away because I am not in uniform. It sounds weird. I don't know why it's that way. But when I'm traveling for leisure, unless it's the heat of summer and it's too hot to wear my uniform, I frequently wear my uniform when traveling for leisure, mostly because I can get through KCM no problem. And sometimes you're treated differently in the airports, I think. Um, yeah, that's it. I love KCM. It's the best thing ever created. Um, monthly guarantee. Most airlines have a monthly guarantee. Uh, ours is 72. We're, we're guaranteed monthly 72 hours of pay. Some airlines are 75 hours, some might be 80 hours, but we are guaranteed 72 hours of pay a month. If you're on reserve, you're guaranteed 72 hours of pay no matter how few hours you work. In September, October, for example, it's very slow. You may only work 20 hours that month. You're guaranteed 72 hours a month, which doesn't sound like a lot and it isn't. But if you pick up a trip out of open time or trade board and you're on reserve, those hours you work are go on top of your 72. So if you have 72 hours minimum on reserve and you pick up 18 hours on your days off, those 18 hours are separate. You get paid for those hours, even if you didn't work off 72 hours. So you just add those 18 on top of your 72. Even if you only worked 20 hours scheduled, but you picked up on your time off, you get a lot more money. So um, it's nice. It's very hard right now to pick up on reserve, so don't get your hopes up. But um, so minimum guarantee, you're guaranteed at least 72 hours with my company. If you're, if you're able to pick up on your days off, you get that much more money. Recurrent, super easy. We uh, have to be uh, recertified every year to do our job. I have a couple of videos about my reaction to recurrent. I find it very stressful. Um, some people call it, some airlines call it CQ. We call it recurrent. So every year, the month of my uh, in my graduation, the month of my hire date, um, I should say, I have to go to recertification or recurrent to keep, continue doing my job. Lead pay, in my company, there's not a lot of opportunity to earn extra money um, outside of commissions for items that we sell on board and for credit card applications. We do get commissions for those things. Uh, but for lead pay, if you fly lead, my position, my airline, it's a, I'm sorry to talk so fast. I just know how fast this this video is going for me. Um, lead pay, I think, is two dollars and twenty five cents right now. Um, so you get two dollars and twenty five cents on top of your regular hourly pay. Nice per diem. I already talked about compliance, uniform compliance. Uh, so we have to be in our full uniform, full compliant uniform. All the uniform pieces have to be in a certain way of fitting. If you're wearing a dress or a skirt, that's the hemline has to be a certain amount above or below your knee. A lot of our younger flood attendants with better legs like to have that skirt or that dress a little higher than is compliant. It happens all the time, it bugs me. Um, Cause there's lots of things I'd love to do about my uniform, but I don't know, I wear it like you're supposed to, personal opinion. Um, Compliance can also be in terms of uh, what our guests are supposed to do, what we require of them in terms of are they following the directions that we give them. 
Um, let's see. Align. Align is a monthly schedule. We bid for reserve line. As I mentioned before, if you are a line holder, that means that you're senior enough to, hold, to actually get a line or a schedule every month and you bid for that um, set by basically your, your preferences and what, what trips you like to fly, what kind of layovers you like to have. You can set those preferences within the computer system that you use when bidding. Uh, we bid for schedules, lines. We also bid for uh, vacation uh, weeks. So if you hear the word bid or the term bid, we're usually talking about bidding for our schedules or a line, uh, but we also bid for our vacation periods. Um, Stand-up pairing. Gosh, stand-up pairing. I have never worked a stand-up, and that's fine with me because... I don't want to. I had to write down the definition because I just didn't, I don't even know what they are. One continuous duty period with more than five hours sit between legs, but less than a rest period. So if I am going to fly from Las Vegas to Seattle, I'm going to sit in Seattle for five hours, six hours, eight hours, and then fly to Cincinnati or Philadelphia. So in that case, I would fly to the first airport. I would have six or eight hours between the next leg. It's not a rest period. It's too short to be a rest period, but it's also too long to be a sit. So they would have me go to a, a local hotel for those hours uh, if they've done their job. Uh, and then I would have to go back to the airport and continue my work day, but it's all still one duty period. Doesn't that sound like hell? It is. Um, I do not do stand-up pairings. Uh, and if I, I, if I saw one on a schedule, I would not bid for it. Uh, and if I accidentally got one, I would drop the trip if I could. There's just no way I'm doing that. Um, a sit is any time that we're sitting, that's what it sounds like, in an airport between flights. Uh, in my airline, if you're sit, scheduled sit, which is different than a delay, if I'm scheduled to sit in an airport for four hours or more, I get a hotel room, a day room, just to sit in that hotel room rather than sit in the airport the whole time. Uh, it is a shared room with a same-sex crew member, if there is one. If it's over five hours, I get my own room. Um, personally, frequently sits are so short so if it's a four hour sit and i have to i get in i have to go find the airport shuttle i have to go to the hotel sign in get to my room and before you know it, i have to turn around and go back to the airport so whether or not i would actually ever use that room up for debate would i take the room yes um and if i weren't given one would i file a ticket with my union yes would i get two hours pay yes for that ticket so if you have not signed up for your union or uh, registered for your union, register so you can file tickets. Um, equipment. Equipment would be a type of, well, there's e safety equipment, which is definitely uh, a common enough phrase. But in uh, the airline, you also might be qualified for different equipment, which would be a type of aircraft. I am qualified to fly Airbus A319s, A320s, and A321s. If Airbus comes out with an, well, they have an A380, right, or something like that. We don't own them. I've not been trained to fly them, so I'm not qualified to fly that type of equipment. When I'm bidding, if I want to bid as a, if I want to bid for chaser lines, which is someone who joins different crews during the course of a trip, um, I would go into Flicka. I would go under equipment. I would choose an A321, for example. And so the my bids that show up in order would show up in order of um, lines that had 321 chase repairing. So I'd be working on a 321. So equipment can be safety equipment, but it can also mean an aircraft. A random, 
I think I mentioned what a random is, but a random could be when you're going through KCM. So TSA could randomly select you for additional security screening, but a random could also be a random drug test. So if you're getting, if you're deplaning, someone might be at that plane at the, the door and say, hey, just so you know, somebody has a random, so no one should use the bathroom. Because if you know, if you go to the bathroom, you can't pee in that little plastic cup, right? Uh, so a random could also be a random drug test. And lastly, because my video is, my camera likes to say, oh, you filmed enough. Uh, lastly, a cars, and I think this is an interesting one. A C A R S, and I wrote this down because I forget it every time. Aircraft communications addressing reporting system. So that is when the ground needs to communicate with the airplane. Frequently, A cars is going to be used between the uh, air traffic control or ops or something and our flight crew. Uh, but if, for example, a reserve flight attendant. Uh, thinks, yay, got one leg done, I'm in Orlando, I'm finished. Eh, not so quick, because crew scheduling might need you to continue working a trip from maybe Orlando to Austin, but it wasn't on your schedule, and they can't call you because you're in the air, right? So they'll use ACARS to communicate with the flight crew, who in turn will let you know that you have to actually call crew scheduling when you got on the ground, or to expect a phone call from crew scheduling once you get on the ground. Uh, but you want to make sure not to call them too soon. Don't call when there are passengers on the aircraft because that would be a big no-no. <laughs> um, but um, so A cars would be the way that the ground could communicate with those people in the air. And if it, if it had to do with a flight attendant, typically it's because you're being rerouted, uh, a flight was canceled, or you're being uh, rescheduled or, or something. So that would be a cars, um, and the end of my terminology list. Uh, and if there's anything I did not uh, say or talk about, or a term or a phrase that you're curious about, drop a comment below. I'll do my best to answer them. I read all of my comments, but lately I'm getting so many that it's hard to really come reply to all of them. So I'll do my best. Thank you very much for watching this whole very long video. And I will see you again soon. Fly safe. Bye.